Seoul was uh, born in just out, outside of Seoul in South Korea in 1964. She's one of the recognized as one of the leading artists of her generation. She's also very uh, widely celebrated um, internationally. She studied sculpture at uh, Hongyek University in the late 1980s, and she graduated in 1987. She began her career in the late 1980s by doing performances. Um, you can see some images of that in the top uh, left corner there. These uh, guerrilla style interventions involving the artist donning soft sculptural forms resembling alien limbs and internal organs as she wandered through public spaces in Seoul and Tokyo were quite uh, radical for their time. And the monster-like forms uh, aim to give expression to collective anxieties and absurd realities within contemporary society. By the second half of the 1990s, uh, the soft sculpture costumes that she wore in public began to evolve into freestanding sculptural objects independent from her body. You can see some of those examples here, uh, giving birth to the Monster series, which is on the top middle and on the right, uh, a work called Sargasso, which is uh, in the M Plus collection, a work from 1998. Soon after, uh, Liebel's work explored themes relating to cyborgs, biotechnology, futurism, robotics, and utopian desire. The bodies that inhabit these sculptures of this period may be seen as disfigured, over-idealized, and grotesque, but they are all ultimately a reflection on our human condition and the vast effects of the technological advancements and media that infiltrates our lives today. Around the 2000s, early 2000s, early, um, um, Drawing upon the political ideologies of the modern world and modernist architecture, Lee took up an interest in urban topographies and phenomena, began portraying failed utopian ideals and political uncertainty through complex sculptural installations. This move from the body to the broader idea of social structures, systems, and architectural forms witnessed another kind of collision, this time between intensely spatial and deeply cerebral experiences. These large-scale productions offer access to interior worlds where reality and dream interconnect. With a sensibility that is closely aligned with science fiction, Lee's work investigates the ways that modern art, architecture, and technology have shaped both our real and imagined worlds. It is this intersection between real and imagined that led me to uh, include her in the current exhibition, so really, you are all gathered here in, mainly because uh, there is an exhibition going on right now at the uh, M Plus Pavilion, uh, which I have put together, uh, five artists, uh, Sites Encountered. Um, Liebel is, of course, one of these artists. Uh, this is an exhibition that looks at the ways in which art is in regular, um, if not constant, conversation uh, with site, uh, place, and surroundings. Um, the show, uh, as you can see, these are the, the other artists that are featured in the exhibition. It spans multiple generations and geographies, and artists who are working in diverse practices who, various, who offer various interpretations of sight that range from tangible to intangible, imagined to real, and who encourage us to think about our relationships to place, the earth beneath us, and the societies that we inhabit. So ideas of sight and place are very much at the center of uh, Lee's uh, practice, particularly the group of uh, maquettes, which are shown uh, in the exhibition currently. Um, these are models of real and fictional buildings, um, real, which refer ultimately to uh, concepts of Russian constructivism, uh, modernist architecture, and in some cases are studies for her own uh, large-scale installations. By representing outsized ambitions in small and intimate forms, Lee underscores the relationships between actual reality and projected imagination and points to the ways in which we look to the past to inform the present. Please uh, join me in join me in uh, welcoming Cole and Lee Bull for their conversation. Okay. Thank you all for being here. I want to thank Pauline for giving me the opportunity to participate in this. Um, Really looking forward to the conversation. Um, let's get right into it. And I wanted to pick up on a few of the, the themes and ideas that, that Pauline gestured towards. Um, I think a lot of the, the, the interviews and, and um, 
readings, the publications about your work, um, rooted in the specificity of your your childhood growing up in South Korea, um, and also in relationship to the patriarchal authority of, of, of traditional Korean culture, the role of women, um, there's a particular specific context to, to the work. At the same time, um, and if we look, maybe we start with the maquettes that are um, part of the, the M plus exhibition. At the same time, um, your engagement with, with architecture, in particular, um, movements like Russian constructivism and modernism um, speak to sort of themes of universality um, and a, a kind of a global standard, right? These were the, the aims of, of some of those early 20th century movements. So could you try and, and maybe um, help us unpack a bit the tension and the friction between that, that specificity and that universality, that the, the generalness and the particularity and, and how your work is maybe positioned or located within that, that tension. So specificity and, and universality are two inseparable things. When you look at those things, uh, looking back in the future, then it might look like they're all planned together. But let's say my childhood comes first. And my childhood experience brings out questions. And it brings out doubts about the time I was living in. And then I try to figure out those questions and doubts. So chronologically speaking, I was somewhat moving toward from my childhood experience to those references, if we call them my recent references. And that will naturally lead to a question, why Russian constructivism in particular? And this is related to my own experience. Um, while growing up, especially in Korea, there was this binary, binary ideology and I was naturally uh, starting to have questions about why we, why we are like in this binary ideology. And then it's just, for me, it comes as natural that will lead to Russian constructivism. It is my temporary point throughout my journey. And I'm passing through that point now. The more I talk, I have this urge to keep adding on, but I think that will slow down our conversation today. <laughs> so I will leave it to you. No, I, I think the other the other term that comes up a lot in relationship to your work is that of utopia. And um, it's I think an important term maybe for our audience. Could you could you give a definition what utopia means to you and, and the extent to which you see utopia as a crucial theme in, in some of your work? Yeah, I talked about this in the in previous interview. Um, the more we talk about the term utopia, it becomes somewhat kitschy. And you all know about the dictionary meaning of utopia. Too many people talk about this word, and even we use this word for product. So if I rephrase this, I'd like to narrow down the term utopia as a proposal for an ideal society. <laughs> I was really struck when I, when I visited the show, of course, by the work and um, particularly by uh, the scale of the work and the variation of, of, of the work uh, in relation to the scale. So um, the other thing I was struck by was um, I couldn't help but think, this is someone, I wonder if she ever wanted to be an architect. And of course, architects, I think often, um, there's a tendency on the part of architects to maybe think of themselves as artists. Someone like Zahadi, for example, or Frank Gehry. Uh, and I wonder if, Architecture was something you ever considered uh, as a profession and, uh, or a career? So I actually talked about this with uh, my previous interview, but I'll share my stories with all the other people who haven't heard that story. Officially, I am the architect, and I always say architect is my favorite job. But at the same time, I'm also very thankful and somewhat relieved that I'm not an architect. And this is because um, the biggest difference, what I think, between artists and architects is no matter what ideas do you, you have, there is this big part for architects that's called human beings or, so to speak, clients. <laughs> and artists do not have that. I can work for myself or I can work for no one at all. So for that, I'm grateful. 
only person you have to satisfy is yourself as an artist. Um, that, that leads, I think, us into a useful, a useful segue. Um, one of your more explicit references to architectural history and, and modernism in particular is this piece, um, after Bruno Kaup, The Wear the Sweetness of Things. And incidentally, this work was just installed at Kaipun and will be on display through the end of the year. Um, so I encourage everyone to visit. Um, I think, uh, I mean, there are, num there are a number of, of um, elements we could talk about in relationship to this work. Uh, what it um, evokes for me is, as, as someone who's currently teaching our design thesis students, our master's students, in preparation for thesis, I, I encourage them to, to speculate, to embrace speculation, to see speculation as something that's essential to their, their architectural education to their careers, that it's, it's what architects do, right, they anticipate. And yet I see a work, in particular the title of, of, of a piece like this, and there's, you seem to be striking a more cautionary, pessimistic, maybe melancholic note about speculation. Um, could you talk a bit, of, a bit more about that? Um, I wonder why you use the word melancholy, because <laughs> not saying you shouldn't feel about that way, but it is just the word many people use to describe their feelings when they see my work. And sometimes I wonder whether that was my own intention to begin with. So I came across Bruno Carr coincidentally somewhat. And when you look at his work at the time, most of his plans went unrealized. Even when you look at a very few things that did become realized, there is a huge gap between what was realized and what he originally dreamed of. And I think this is because there were some realistic problems. And I came across discovering this drawing of his called Stern Bow. And looking at it, I, I, I think that he knew it was impossible to realize that at the time, but he did not cease to pursue it. And that means what was ideal to him was the architecture, the idea architecture is, is a planet. Like literally it's a planet. And as a human being, we cannot realize it yet. And does that mean it, it is a proposal for the future? Or was it his own anticipation? Even knowing that it was impossible, he still wanted to go and see how far he could go and pursue with his own idea. For me, that is what I call pure approach. And that pure approach invoked many feelings to me. It's something that is impossible to be realized at this time, but there is a beauty in dreaming something grand and majestic. And maybe that's why people feel, they, they feel melancholy when they look at my work. And I hope this satisfies your question. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the history of modernism uh, and architecture more generally uh, is littered with unrealized schemes, right? That's in many ways, again, what architects do. Uh, these are two projects, both of which are in the M plus collection uh, for unbuilt utopian projects, let's say, Archigram on my left and Lucas Woods Underground Berlin from the 1980s. But it's interesting that you have, um, with, with constructivism and with Bruno Kauf, you seem to have focused on a specific moment, the early 20th century, for your work, rather than kind of other utopian moments, let's say, in the architectural, in architectural history. Uh, what is it specifically, maybe, about that, that moment, the turn of the century, the, the early 20th century, that's so compelling? Okay, so I deliberately chose the early 20th centuries. This is because I found something interesting about these times. And if I go beyond 20th century, then I felt like I will be forever lost to search for different times. And that means why modern times? This, this will be the next question. And when you think about it, all the concepts that we have about human beings, such as own ego or self, they were all conceived during the modern times. The way I think, the ideas I have, the concepts I think of, they were all from the modern times. Not all of the Almost. <laughs> <laughs> and 
that makes me think that I have this modern times way of thinking. And during the early times of the modern time, this was when those ideal ideas were being created and conceived. That's why I focus on those times. But it wasn't like I focused on those specific times from the early, of, early years of my career. I just started to tracing back from what is close from the present point. And that became the modern times, the early modern times. Uh, when, we, when you look at my early works, such as Monger and Lucy, um, you see how plywood came to be utilized in, in, in our daily life. And I was wondering, and I became curious, where those ideas started. And that led me to constructivism. So this journey, it wasn't like I was very deliberate and intentional. I took more of somewhat a relaxed approach, jumping from different ideas. Um, but when you look at my studies or, or all the references that are somewhat explicitly appearing in my words, um, that's why I think you asking me uh, why modern times is specifically. Well, that, that's a useful transition into questions of process. And I'm sure you, like many artists, detest questions about process. <laughs> but if we could just talk a bit about this work in particular, which is also in the Emily Plus show. Um, and specifically, I'm thinking uh, about the... the the process of assemblage, of the putting together of parts. And uh, what struck me when I saw this work was, um, it, it reminded me of, a, of a, an essay by Adolf Loos on, called Building Materials. And in that piece, he talks about how when people talk about material, what they're really talking about is labor, work, and the, the, the labor that's required to actually produce that material, to put that material together. And, um, so that this in, the, this this work really evoked that relationship to me, mm -hmm. the connection between materiality and labor. And I, I wondered if you could talk a bit about mm -hmm. that that connection and, and work mm -hmm. in relation to your object. Okay, this is somewhat this is a familiar approach to me as well. Um, when you look at my works from my early years, so to speak, from the eighties and nineties. Um, I used lots of sparkling beads or sparkling fabrics. And the, the reason I used those fabrics were exactly what you talked about. I used all those materials that were at the time conceived as mere decoration. You, so, you might think those materials are somewhat kitschy, and you might think um, those materials couldn't be seen serious. And that is why I used those materials from the 70s and 80s because those beads and sparkling fabrics, they were the very produce of housewives at the time. So even though some people think those are decoration or they think those are commercial materials, um, I think material, materials and labor are two inseparable things. In this work, almost every material cannot be separated from labor. Even though it was created regardless of human involvement, in, in the cycle from the creation through the consumption, humans are involved in some ways. And that brings me to a question, to what extent we should try to see the context of materials? And for this work, I used uh, the materials intentionally. And this is the exact same materials I used first time bow and some people just thought this was decoration. Some people even said it looked like chandelier, which I didn't like. And this is for me another version of stern bow. And it's just same material but expressed in a different way. And some people think it's just decoration or some people see it as architecture or something structural. But those who see my this work as mere decoration, it means they cannot see beyond the decoration. And this is a very easy trap many people can fall into. I think the, the other question related to process I had was again, um, tying back to this idea of scale and um, how you work through models. Um, I wanted to 
ask you a bit about um, which comes first. Uh, do you begin with with a drawing? Do you begin with a model? With a model? Do they both do they both kind of materialize at the same time? How many models might you complete on average for for, for a work such as Thaw? Um, can you can you walk us a bit through the relationship between the models and the and the the um, completed uh, life size work? Um, it depends on ideas. Um, I usually start from drawings and I write down all the details about what I imagine and what could be realized in my drawings. And the reason why I started to draw first is because of the characteristics of sculptures. Because it takes such a long time from the point of conception to the actual realization. And I cannot just hold on to one idea during this whole journey and process. And I keep thinking about different ideas. So that's why I write down all the details of what I'm imagining at the time through my drawings. And some people even say my drawings are exact representation of my sculptures. And that is because I write down all the details in my drawings. But on the other hand, there are some cases when drawings cannot make it, uh, drawings are not clear for me to see what my work could be when it's finally realized. And then I test on models. And as you can see, those are the miniatures I made. And so I start with the miniatures and I scale them up and add, add more details in the end. Um, but some, in some cases, I ended up making about 20 models because I couldn't find the direction I wanted to pursue. I think that is because there is this gap between imagination and what could be realized. And I'm not sure whether I could narrow down this gap the more I work because recently I've experienced all too many failures. So I wonder whether I will become better at it later with more trainings and practices. For most of my three-dimensional works, um, drawings and models are my own way to figure out how to solve technological problems to realize my works. Because I work without the help of engineers because I want to figure out my own way to realize my works. So I write down all the details about the materials and the process and the method of how to use them. And this is some, I think, what architects would call a design but I'm very humble to use the word design. And, and I, this, through this experience, I accumulate more experiences. Um, but in fact, actually, those techniques I'm use, using, it's somewhat low-tech and somewhat easy.